Hello, everyone, and welcome to Inside Leather History, a fireside chat. I'm Doug O'Keefe. I am the host and producer of the chats, which are a program of the Leather Archives and Museum. Today, I'm interviewing Girl Ange, who was Imsel 2018. Was it Imsel BB, Imsel Bubba at the time? I want to make sure we get that right. That's great. Great question. Yes, it's Imsel BB is how we refer to it, or Imsel Boot Black. Um, there's a, a couple of different names how it's referred to, but it's always, we always have our boot blacks. Let's go, let's start right at the very beginning. Tell me a little bit about your growing up, where you're from, your family, mm -hmm. that kind of thing. For sure. So I was born in Toowoomba, which is a fairly small little town up in Queensland, Australia. Um, and I was there for up until my 20s. I moved around a little bit, um, but the last 20 years or so, a little bit more than 20 years, I've been down um, in and around Melbourne area in Victoria, which I really love. So I'm one of four. I have an older brother and two younger siblings. Um, and I don't know what else to tell you. My childhood was okay. We didn't have a truckload of money, but um, that was fine. I kind of got a bit rambunctious when I was maybe 12 or 13. Um, yeah, started having a little bit more of a wild time and uh, finding finding out a little bit more about who I am and finding my feet and how I was going to walk in this world. Well, tell me more about that. You said you were discovering yourself and having a little bit of a wild time. What were you <laughs> discovering? I think finding my independence. One of the fantastic things about my the um, my parents was that they didn't believe in grounding so they didn't ground any of us and we had other there was other disciplinary stuff that happened but that was not one of them and so you know if if things got crazy as they do inside everybody's head when they're a teenager you know and I just needed to get out I would go for a walk I'd go for a walk I'd visit friends so um, you know, at that point, my independence gained some level of confidence, I guess, just that if I want to do something, I can go do it. And if I was in a situation that I didn't need to be in or I was in a place that felt uncomfortable, I could move. Did you discover, you know, gay people at that time? Did you discover any kind of a community at that time? Well, well... Well, I don't, I don't know how far I can go down that path. Um, <laughs> when I was younger, I had a birthday party, which wasn't a common occurrence. Um, and you know what? Let's just leave it. At the birthday party, I did some exploring where I was very bossy. And my party was attended by um, all female identified people. And um, we had a lovely time. <laughs> I think my bossy femininity was coming out at an early age. Let's just put it that way. <laughs> uh, what does bossy femininity mean to you? Well, now, now that I have more language and more understanding around it, um, I identify with the left side of the slash, although I am a switch. Um, I'm quite confident in the role of being the dominant or the... Um, you know the handler in a in a situation or relationship um and that fits well with me I've had the exciting honor to be a submissive um to be collared and um, to walk through different DS roles over the years and that's all been an amazing learning experience that I you know I took so much away from uh, but now as I'm older, I've very much settled into who I am and how I roll and, and what feels comfortable. Well, tell me a little bit more about being collared, being a sub, and the other things that led you to where you are now. Well, let's wind back to, I think the first time that I found myself in um, a position of dominance was I started going to a um, 
a kink. Oh my gosh, I've just lost words. I, I started going to a, a kink venue. It was very queer, welcoming, um, and it was called Abode in Australia. And I, after a while of going there um, and getting to know people and and exploring a little, a few of my own kinks, and <clears throat> I came, I had the, the owners came to me and said, we need a new door, bitch. How do you feel about that? And so before very long of entering into a kind of out outside of the house kinky world, I found myself at a boat and working the front desk reception as well and I loved it I was uh, Miss Angel <laughs> and everybody had best be nice to me and if I told you to stand and wait in the correct queue then I would appreciate that you did that and I, I guess at that time um somebody else kind of put that put that jacket on me and it fit and I had a lot of fun and I had a great experience and it was I don't know I can't even remember it was years <laughs> later that I kind of questioned how much of that role was me and how much of the opposite side of the slash also fit me well and was it other people choosing what they saw in me and who they thought I was or was this my decision so I explored that um I I was collared to Sarge also an amazing Imsel one of my Imsel sisters so I was collared to her for a number of years and that was very much an experience of learning what it was like to be on the other side of the slash and um, understanding with greater detail what it was that I could give to somebody else and how I could make somebody else feel and their confidence and the support that I could give somebody else and how much of an impact my words and actions had on somebody else when that DS was in play. Uh, so that was amazing. It was a real eye-opener. Fascinating. Uh, yeah. Let's take a step back before we go forward. Okay. Bring me bring me to where you first had some concept of kink and and anything to do with that. When I moved to Melbourne, not long after I had moved to Melbourne, so maybe 20, 25 years ago, I met an amazing human that was dressed in a suit at a lesbian bar. And their name was Tommy. And I walked in with some other people that I had only met recently as well. And this gentleman bought me a champagne and we sat down at the table and we conversed all night. And they were very much and are very much a dominant and have a very strong daddy energy about them. And they're also very much into kink. So I, after that conversation, was just flustered and amazed and they are an AFAB person so I at that point I think the understanding of DS and energy exchange became something that I very much craved so Tommy had been to a boat before and told me about a boat and we chatted and messaged and got to know each other better and then one night I popped into a boat on my birthday for the very first time and messaged Tommy and said, Tommy, I'm here at a boat. What are you doing tonight? Come on down. Fascinating. You came into it a little later in life. I did. I did. I think personally, kinky things were, I was attracted to kinky things and energy exchange and but I wasn't in a place where that happened. I didn't have the language. I didn't know anybody. I mean, some of my sex was pretty kinky prior to that. 
if I'm going to think about maybe um, vanilla sex or something like that, how it was way back in the beginning. You know, there was, well, even back in the beginning, um, fisting or feeling as full as I possibly could was definitely a kink way back in the beginning. In your, in, from your small town in Australia, mm-hmm. what brought you to Melbourne? The town that I was living in before I moved to Melbourne was Bundaberg, and I loved it up there. I had an incredible time up there. However, it was getting a bit small. I kind of feel like, you know, th- there wasn't really much that excited me about that place anymore. And so I moved down to Melbourne to um, hook up with, with the girl, and it didn't work out. But <laughs> I fell in love with Melbourne. Melbourne is amazing. <laughs> Well, tell me a little bit about the Melbourne you discovered. So the Melbourne that I discovered when I first got there was theatre, art, culture, hospitality, um, a different energy, a more open, understanding, accepting energy of people with less, um, I don't know, that there, there was... I felt that it could be a place. It felt like it could be home. And then later on, um, you know, thanks thanks to Tommy, there was a lot of reading and there was a lot of um, events that I attended and people that I spoke to. And I actually brought a lot of people to the club for the first time and, and, you know, was able to share my love and passion of kink. And that is where I came across leather in that space as well. I see. I see. Were you able to go to places like, I don't know, the Laird? (laughs) Oh, no. (laughs) Well, no, I have been there a few times. Laird is a men's only venue. It didn't begin that way, but it has been for a long time now. Um, And they have a number, they have a limit to the number of gender inclusive events that they're allowed to hold each year. Um, And if they go over that, then they're in trouble. So the only leather bar in Melbourne uh, is men's only. So there was a gender inclusive leather club when I was running for my title. um, And that club had been uh, up and running for quite a while. Um, That's no longer happening at the moment. In Melbourne, as you were beginning this exploration, tell me about some of the activities that were new to you, that excited you, and that opened your eyes. I, in the very beginning, I didn't know that a female could be a dominant. Like this, you know, this is way back, like this is way back in the beginning. And and my concept and understanding was limited. I remember one time after reading some novel that got me hot and horny, I um, there was a dominant in a space at a party that I liked and I knelt quietly in a corner in the position that had been described in this book that I was reading and waited until I was approached and noticed. And that for me was such a beautiful experience. Another experience that I had um, at abode in in a similar time frame was it got back to me that there was a female identified person there that didn't believe that there was any female that could dominate her and I'm like oh oh pardon me I think we need to meet so that that was also super exciting for me just like, I don't know, open, opening people's minds, opening my mind, um, understanding that there's more, that there's more than just what I've read, there's more than just what I've done, there's always something to learn. I love, I love learning. Um, I love other people's brains as well. I love understanding what makes a person tick or um, having incredible conversations with people that have a different opinion from from me. Um, And it doesn't mean you need to leave that conversation with either person's opinion changed. It's just, it's an opportunity to hear the other side of the story, to balance out um, any preconceptions, to be able to take a look at something from a broader perspective. And being able to share that with other people is huge as well. Were you able to dominate that person? 
Yes. <laughs> yes, I was. We met and, and we had a brief conversation and shortly thereafter she was on her knees and she was doing as instructed and she reveled in that moment as much as I reveled in that moment. It was it was beautiful. And I don't remember her name and I don't know that I've ever bumped into her again. I I have to say from my own point of view, I've always felt that the leather kink communities in Australia are relatively small compared to what we see in Europe and here in North America. So I would find fascinating that some of these people wouldn't overlap for you. It is a fairly small community, although I would say that the kink community is larger. And if we're going to have a look at, you know, the bears and the pups and rubber and all of our brothers and sisters across all of the community, then it gets a bit bigger. Mm. Compared to over here, it is nothing. <laughs> it is tiny. I mean, I don't, yeah, it's not, it's, it's definitely nothing like, like what's over here, the opportunity to attend conferences and to meet people, the number of bars that are aware of what leather is and welcome leather people in the door every Friday night for the gathering. Um, you know, it's, it, it's much, there's a lot more awareness over here in the States than there is in Australia. Um, even though, you know, at, even today over here I still bump into the oh you guys are into that hurting each other stuff <laughs> I'm like ah, hold on a minute oh, you line. know they really want to do it you know that they <laughs> and I, I just want to clarify for the for the audience viewing this that you're currently in Dallas Texas yes. in the states uh although you are from Australia I just want to make that right. clear <laughs> yes, I've been traveling backwards and forwards now since I won the title. So, and I love it here. I love it at home. This place feels like home as well. Um, I very much found people that I call family and that I feel comfortable with and that, you know, we know each other and we love each other. You, as you blossomed in Melbourne and discovered this amazing community and learned so many wonderful things. Tell me how you progressed toward doing a title. So, leather community. So Sarge came over to Australia, Sarge Imsel 2015, came over to Australia um, during her title year. She came over a few times actually, but during her title year, I got to meet her mm. and my daddy at the time, who is also leather, um, him and I spent a bit of time with Sarge and after that he approached Sarge and said would you mentor mentor my girl oh and she said yes so that that it was it was not my intention I did not strive for that I at that point didn't even have a very good understanding of contests and how they worked and that they were on an international level. I mean, the contests in Australia, majority of them I can't attend. I think I had been to maybe three contests before I competed for Insel. I had held no title. There was no title to hold for anyone female identified for three years before I ran for Insel. I couldn't test the water. There was nothing. Incredible. <laughs> I, I also find it a little sad that, that you yeah. haven't been able to attend a lot of those. Yeah, yeah. I mean, every community evolves at its own pace and that is influenced by the people, the level of education, sometimes money, um, there's a lot of things that are involved in how a community evolves. And some of the some of the differences that I've noted across the world are that some communities are kind of hitched on a few things. 
And unfortunately, the Australian community, almost across the board, is hitched on it being a men's, a men's space. It's for men. So, you know, that, that, that's, that's different. Giving kudos to the Australian community, um, in Melbourne at the lead, we allowed our trans brothers in while there's other communities, even here in the States, that are like, what's in your pants before you walk in the door? Yeah, yeah. Unacceptable in my books. Just as, you know, just as it's also not okay to not have, to not welcome diversity. Diversity is strength. Put all of our voices forward. Let everyone be heard. Yes. That's super important to me. And it doesn't matter what's hanging off your chest or not, or what's between your legs, what you were born with, what it is now. Everybody deserves to be invited in. Yes. Not all of the time. Um, every every pocket, every bucket, every group should have, you know, the ability um, to have their own, you know, it's just a pub night. If you don't identify as a pub, then don't come tonight. You know, have a men's night, have a female identified night, have an inclusive night. But I think it's, yeah, I think Australia has a bit of work to do. I don't know a truckload about the communities on the West Coast, but I do know that Adelaide, Adelaide is making leaps and bounds. And, um, you know, the people that are pushing that community forward are so focused on inclusivity and so focused on um, bringing diversity into their community. Wow. And they are doing such a fantastic job at it. Wow. I wasn't aware of that. Yeah. Yeah. Adelaide, wow. gender inclusivity, Adelaide, they go together. Wonderful to hear. <laughs> Wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. So when you were working with, working to prepare for, for a future in the community, did you actually have any kind of a contest? How did you manage to qualify to go on to a higher level in the IMSL contest series? With the IMSL contest, there is no prerequisite that you've held a title. Oh, I didn't know that. Um, so that's why I was able to. Okay. It's open to everyone. Not everybody has you know, especially in Australia, and I'm sure that there's other places in the world, we don't have a community that's big enough or with enough money or a venue that can have a title. Yeah, yeah. I, I find fascinating because that's the first I've heard of that. And I wondered how you managed without that. <laughs> Um, Sarge was an incredible mentor. She, she was mentoring me heavily, like heavy work for a year and a half, two years before I ran for the title. Um, do you know what? It may even be longer than that because I went over to Imsel in 2017 to see what it was like and have a better understanding of mm. what I was preparing for and what this contest was like and and start to wrap my head around it, it, the ins and outs of the leather world in the US, which is very different from my experience in the States. So Sarge made that happen. My community, you know, across the board with all of its clusters contributed hugely to me being able to go. I had a massive fundraiser before I left. Wow. I had no money. I had stopped working a few months prior running for the title because I couldn't work and prepare. What work was Sarge having you do? What preparations were you doing? One of the things was social media. Coming to understand um, what the world of leather looked like on Facebook what prominent people in the community, how they communicated on Facebook. What did they post? What did wow. people interact with? What did people ignore? Um, what photos worked well? What was visually pleasing about a picture? Um, 
how to present myself on a platform that I had very, very little interaction with any of them in an online manner. I was running for an international title and I was Australian. Nobody knew who I was. Yeah. So how am I going to let people know who I am and how is that going to be perceived? And we might speak a similar version of English as Australians have chopped it up pretty bad. <laughs> but <laughs> there is... <laughs> There is so many cultural differences. There was so much that I had to learn to be able to communicate on a level. Give me an example. um, My understanding of cultural appropriation was zero before I came to the States the first time. Okay. One of my sons is Indigenous Australian. And it's different over there. It's different over there, but learning the, the, the smaller things that I was doing that contribute, that were racist. For example? There was one time I remember going to Sarge with, I'd, I think I'd screenshot some messages from a thread um, somebody had put up a post about some racism, something, something that had upset them. And I was reading down through the thread and somebody had made a comment and there was a lot of backlash um, about this comment. And I was just confused. Like, why is that a bad thing to say? Like, wh- how how is this person being disrespectful or rude or ignorant like and so I can't remember exactly what the post was or what the person said but little like stuff like that I'm like like tell me why it's important so there was a lot of conversations and I'm so grateful that I had so many people around me over the last few years to help me learn and understand and you know I spent time researching I spent time on my own learning what these things are and you know after my first solid chunk of time over here which I think was about three months two and a half three months just after I won the title um going back to Australia and listening to you know um one of the favorite radio stations while I was driving the car around and hearing things that I was like oh oh, you can't say that. And then I was like, wait a minute, wait a minute. People over here don't know that. People don't over here don't, you know, in Australia don't understand the full story and the bigger picture of why this is racism. And so, you know, even friends and family, having conversations with friends and family about white male privilege. And they're like, and I'm like, no, no. <laughs> you need to listen, uh, or can you please listen? And and you laughing me off right now is a part of this. You know, it's just it's just not the education is you know around certain topics are just not as advanced as they are over here. That's fascinating. I uh, I can't say that I've experienced that when I've visited Australia, but. To hear you say that, it's clearly very profound for you. It was. I mean, there was a million different learning curves, um, and and one that one that you know one of the ones that's super important to me is learning how to walk this earth in a better way, how to interact with people in a more respectful way. Like, I don't intentionally want to rock around hurting people's feelings you know like that's not that's not how I want to walk in this life that's fascinating what do you feel though was the most difficult thing Sarge had you do in preparation I don't know if it was the most difficult but it was definitely something that I procrastinated about and I was challenged by and that was when she said, you need to start working on your speech. 
What topic did you choose? You know, like there was five things. So there was five things that I focused on, on kind of, hey, guys, like check where your priorities are at. What about this stuff? What about we focus on this for a minute? Because if we all did that just a little bit, wow. How was the speech received? The speech was presented and intentionally so to make people go, what the fuck, and then come back in and have a listen. Okay. So, and it did. And there was people that came up afterwards and said, holy shit, I can't believe you said that up there. And I was like, it was said to me and it shocked me and, and it took me a while to ponder on it, but I, I thought it was worthwhile sharing with you too. And there was other people that came up and they were like, uh, you know, your speech was amazing. Like I, want, I needed to hear that. I'm at a place where that really resonated with me. In all of the preparation that Sarge put you through, you procrastinated most about the speech. But I did. What else in that whole arena was challenging to you? Being able to show my passions um, I, on, online virtually was, was an understanding. Learning how to take a photo of myself. How, do I look pretty this way? Do uh. I look pretty this way? <laughs> you know, all of that's important. Um, preparing the outfits. I had a spreadsheet for my outfits before I ran for IMSL and I'm a leather worker. A lot of the stuff that I wore, I had made myself. So, wow. yeah. So there was a lot, you know, there was a lot of leather work to be done, but you know, I, I don't know if was, was there 20, 20 something outfits wow. for that contest weekend for those four days uh, you know and backup bits if something didn't work or yeah you know there was there was a truckload of prep raising the money I didn't I'm not I don't have money <laughs> I had to find that money I'd never put on a fundraiser before I had to learn how to walk up to somebody um and sell raffle tickets to show that I could raise money I then had to put on a fundraiser for myself I had to go into people's place of work and shops that they owned, the businesses that they ran and say, hi, can you please give me something to raise money for myself? Like there was a lot of work. <laughs> there was a lot of work put into this. How did the local community uh, see you in all of this? It was incredible. I mean, there had been a couple of people that had run for IMSO and there'd been a bunch of the dudes that had run for IML. Um, and, you know, I guess that there was a level of, you know, this is not really something an Australian wins and Americans going to win this, you know, North America, that's who wins this contest, especially for, you know, IMSO and IMSVB. So, um, I guess there there was, you know, and there have been other people that have gone and tried um, that haven't won. So I guess there was that level of, um, you know, I might not make it or, you know, that they thought that I might not make it. But I was also determined. So the thing with this contest was I didn't step into it thinking I could win. I stepped into it purely to see what my very best looked like, like you mentioned you made your own uh, leathers for mm -hmm. Imsel BB. Tell it. me a bit about that. What kinds of things did you make? My favourite piece was actually the skirt, the wraparound skirt that I was wearing when I won. Um, so I had, I had a bunch of leather scraps. You know, they were the edges and the corners and the leg bits and they would dry or they had holes in them or they got thick or you know the color wasn't consistent stuff like that so I had all of these leather scraps and I wanted to make myself a patchwork skirt and it's really important to me ethically to use every single part of that animal skin wow now 
Tell me your first thoughts when you got to Imsel BB. I'm sorry, Imsel BB. Holy shit, have I got everything sorted? Sarge isn't arriving for another three hours. If I haven't got something done that's on her list. <laughs> that was my very first thought. All of the letters came out and every single one of them was conditioned. That's the first thing I did when I hit the hotel. Um, and, yeah, yeah, just got everything ready. What was your fantasy? Um, my fantasy. So one of the things that I did um, to... One of the things that I did that I was super passionate about that was also a fundraiser and that I wanted the world to know about me was that I am into squirting. I squirt myself. I love to make other people squirt. I'm all about the squirting. So I created the squirter hanky. So my fantasy, <laughs> my fantasy was um, Alice in Wonderland. And basically we were having a tea party. We ran out of tea in the teapot and so um, we all, you know, had sex and jacked off and we would pull the squirter hankies out and throw them around the stage to represent squirt just going everywhere as it does so deliciously. Um, yeah, so that was my fantasy. It was just, you know, it was the chaos of squirter hankies and and fantastic outfits. I made myself the cutest little Alice in Wonderland leather dress, which I absolutely adore. Um, yeah, it was it was really good. <laughs> I don't suppose you've got one of the hankies handy there to show us. I do. I sure do. <laughs> so this. Oh, how interesting! Is the squared hanky the squared flagging hanky? So the design. I don't know if you were able to pick it out. Yes. But the design is a head, torso, spread legs, and squirting. That is amazing. <laughs> and there was also a little pin made for those that. of us that are squirters and love squirting. Wow, I love it. <laughs> Wow. It was a fantastic fundraiser and it was also a fantastic way to um, um, kind of bring that up, bring up the conversation for a lot of people. I can't tell you how many people came up to me and said, um, I've always squirted during sex and I'm so embarrassed about it that um, it, be you know, it, it became a bit of a phobia for me or... I squirted once three years ago and I haven't been able to do it again. How do I do it again? I really liked it. Or people that came up to me and they were like, my partner loves to squirt and I've only made them do it once. How do I get them to do it again? But just bringing up that conversation and removing some of the stigmatism or whatever people think about it, I'm like, oh, no, it's a part of sex quite often and it's delicious and yummy and let's talk about this. And it's one of my favorite things and has been for a really long time. Now, going back to the contest, uh -huh. what did you feel? How did you feel when you were announced the winner? Well, first of all, I thought that they got the details wrong <laughs> because I started off with from Melbourne. I'm like, oh, no, no, no. They just got my city mixed up with somebody else. And then, and it wasn't until they got to the very end of the, you know, girl and your new 2018 IMSA or whatever it was that I was like, oh shit, no, that's me. Because the thing was, is I didn't think I could win. I didn't go in there with any assumption that little old Angela from Australia <laughs> could travel halfway around the world and win an international contest in America, like I said, I'd never held a title. I'd been to maybe three or four contests other than IMSA the previous year. I'd never held one. If I was about to win this thing, then I really needed to convince those judges. And my contestant class were amazing human. How many They're contestants all... were there? My year, there was five running for IMSA and three running for Bootler, eight, ten. 
it wasn't a huge year, but for IMS or BB contest, it was it was a decent amount. There's been less before. There's been more before. Okay. What was the first thing you did after winning? I think I was just ridiculously overwhelmed. I had had maybe two or three hours sleep for the last four nights in a row. I had been exhausted and pushed myself to my limit of um, being on and being present and remembering everything and being at places at the right time and, you know, um, also my sir was with me the entire time. So there's also that relationship. I re My behaviour and I represent my if I do something silly, I'm embarrassing my sir. Like, don't do that. Um, al along with the contest. So it, it was just huge. You know, there were some people that had said to me over the weekend, you're doing a great job. And I'm like, yeah, you guys love me, but. <laughs> <laughs> so it wasn't, it, it really honestly wasn't until they read out my name that I was like, oh, Oh, I did have what it takes. Wow. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. Here goes. Sacha prepped me as much as possible to yeah. understand what the year ahead might look like and might feel like. And, you know, there'd be times when you're tired. You don't want to get dressed up and go to the event and you don't want all of the attention to be on you. You want to go over into a corner and play with somebody. And you know what? You've got 20 people around you asking questions. Yes. It's it that year is not about you. It's That's right. about everyone else. It's you give yourself, you put yourself to the back of the queue and yeah. you give everything that you have to everybody else. And then you get to a point where you're like, oh, okay. No, wait a minute. I need I need to give myself a little something. But but then but but that's what a title is. The title you wear the sash. You do the work. Yes. This, this is not. This is this is not all pomp and fancy and you know, it. You're there for the community. You're there to support other people. You're there to listen. You're yeah. there to help educate. You're there to. Um, represent your home community, represent a different type of leather to somebody that's never seen anything like you before, to give people a voice yes. that don't, that are not heard. Yeah. And to listen, like, it's not all about you. It's all about everybody else. <laughs> yeah. uh, during your title year, you... I, I don't even know what you call it, but you, you made a wonderful game out of acting as Australian interpreter <laughs> for the Australian con contestants at IML because uh, they had started doing uh, the stage questions in the native language of the contestant. Yeah, the puppies. Spanish, French, whatever. Yeah. So the question was asked in American English and out you came with this over exaggerated hysterical version of Australian English for these people. I can't imagine what those contestants must have thought. I don't know if they even expected it, <laughs> but I got to see you do that. I stood backstage laughing so hard. I was afraid they'd throw me out. <laughs> So tell me about that experience. That had to be quite something. It was amazing. So Jeff came up to me at the beginning of the, the weekend. Jeff Tucker. Um, Jeff Tucker, yes, sorry, apologies. Actually, no, it wasn't the very beginning. It was like the, on the second day or something. Anyway, he said, I've got an idea. <laughs> <laughs> he said, so the, the people that have you know, that have different languages. The first language are having the question asked in their native language as well. Would you like to get up there um, and do that for your Aussie brothers that are having a crack? And I would jump at the chance. I jumped at the chance. It was so much fun. I translated the questions into the most bogan Aussie 
like Mike, like yeah. with the twang. Like I turned it all the way up. And yes. yeah, I don't even know if the audience understood half of what I was saying, but they had a great laugh. Jeff Tucker was stoked at the end of it. He said, that went down a treat. You were brilliant. Um, the guys told me afterwards that the contestants in the green room also had had a delicious laugh at it and that it had been absolutely hysterical. People were coming up for the rest of the weekend going, oh, my gosh, I saw you. <laughs> I saw you on stage doing your thing, and that was hilarious. <laughs> so it was a memorable moment for a lot of people. It was also super cool to get up there um, and be the current IMSO up on that IML stage. You know, it's been a while since we've had the opportunity to be one of the judges. And it's fantastic that the IMSO BB still gets to participate in that contest. And we have our IMLs and um, International Mr. Boot Blacks come and, come and judge for the women's contest. But to be able to, just to be able to be seen, you know, show a few of the dudes that the community is bigger than just them. You've spoken a lot now about mentoring. What are your thoughts and what is your advice for new people coming into the community and mentoring and seeking mentoring? Yeah. Um, my advice is to reach out. Sometimes it's kind of scary to reach out, like asking people for donations for a fundraiser to raise money for yourself. You know, those sort of things can be scary socially. So reach out. Understand that there is not one true way. Nobody is going to be able to tell you everything about all of the things. Ask questions. Be respectful. Um, look for a mentor. There may not be one in your home community. There may not be one in your state. But search broader. Yeah. There, I, there is a lot of people that are publicly accessible continuously on many different platforms that will answer your questions um, or guide you in the direction of somebody that could answer your questions. Uh, be open-minded um, to learning things from people or places that you don't expect. If you're sincerely craving knowledge, you will find it. Well, girl, Ange, I would like to thank you for an amazing interview <laughs> for Inside Leather History, a fireside chat. You have been such a pleasure to talk to, and it's been, I felt really comfortable um, speaking.